I want to say thank you to my mother who is here tonight. You'll we'll see her in a little while. But she grew up in the 1950s in Waycross, Georgia, picking somebody else's cotton and somebody else's tobacco. But tonight she helped pick her youngest son to be a United States senator. From a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, tips on reducing your family orthodontia bill when your kid's teeth resemble Baraka from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And now, the podcast host whose teeth are as straight and inspirational as Anthony Robbins, <laughs> Pete Dominic! Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Pete You know, I didn't have braces. My teeth were always straight. They were just misshapen on their own. So I did have a little bit of cosmetic dentistry, some porcelain veneers. First bonding when I was in uh, like high school. Because I had like a peg teeth, you know, they were like kind of pointed. And then that didn't hold into my adulthood. I had to get that replaced when I went into show business. I got porcelain veneers and they were expensive. And the only way I was able to afford them in my early 20s, at the beginning of my career, was by bartering with a dentist. I was a personal trainer and I gave him like 30 sessions and he gave me uh, four teeth four porcelain veneers on my top fronts so if you notice how perfect they are you can thank the late great dr stanley sir guts thank you sir well folks there is uh, so much to talk about today i know you didn't just come here to hear about my dental challenges and triumphs but lots to talk about in the news. Two great guests joining me coming up. I've got Dr. Brian Rosenwald of the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League PhD joining me today. And the great Jared Yates Sexton joins me as well on today's program. I sat down with both these guys, however, before the results of last night's runoff election for the Georgia Senate seat concluded where, of course, Raphael Warnock was successful and triumphant thanks to so much organization, real people doing very impressive things, including folks like Vicky and Francis, who listen to this show, making phone calls. Vicky, of course, lives down there in Georgia and hundreds of thousands of more people, both volunteering and, of course, voting in Georgia to help Raphael Warnock across the finish line and just barely. It's terrifying and greatly upsetting that the margin was so thin. I think Sherilyn Eiffel put it perfectly when she tweeted last night, the closeness of this race is among the most depressing and ominous things I've seen in American politics in my lifetime. Here's Blake Hounshell last night in the New York Times at midnight recap. And it's Senator Raphael Warnock defeated Herschel Walker in convincing fashion on Tuesday, overcoming a difficult national environment for Democrats and cementing Georgia's status as the crucible of American politics. Mr. Warnock not only gave Democrats some breathing room in a closely divided Senate, but also provided grist for Republicans hoping to dethrone former President Donald J. Trump as the leader of their party. Even as the votes are still being tallied, Mr. Trump's critics on the right were lashing him for saddling them with an untested and troubled candidate for a seat they believed was theirs to win. Mr. Warnock's victory also guaranteed, if there was any doubt, that Georgia will be hotly contested two years from now when President Biden or another Democrat tries to repeat his feat from 2020 when he flipped the state blue. Of course, Raphael Warnock won a six-year term in the Senate, folks. Lots to take away from Raphael Warnock's win last night that Republicans chose, obviously, this terrible candidate. Herschel Walker's loss turns up the heat on President Trump, former disgraced President Trump. Georgia will again be a key state in the presidential map in 2024. Democrats have built a turnout machine in Georgia. And finally, one more takeaway. 
Democrats overcame a restrictive new voting law. New York Times writes, if Georgia Republicans were hoping that making it harder to vote would help them win back the Senate seat they lost in 2021, they were wrong. And there are signs that the changes they put in place may have backfired in some respects. Here is Raphael Warnock talking about the long lines and everything that people had to endure just to vote. Now, there are those who will look at the outcome of this race and say that, yes, you're right, we won. But there are those who would look at the outcome of this race and say that there's no voter suppression in Georgia. Let me be clear. Just because people endured long lines that wrapped around buildings, some blocks long, just because they endured the rain and the cold and all kinds of tricks in order to vote, doesn't mean that voter suppression does not exist. It simply means that you, the people, have decided that your voices will not be silenced. Let us not forget, let us not forget that when we entered this runoff, a vestige of the ugly side of our complicated American story, state officials said that we couldn't vote on Saturday. But we sued them and we won. Yeah, that wasn't all. I mean, there was all kinds of things that were that were put in place, made law to make it difficult. Anticipating long lines at the polls, civil rights groups also planned what was called parties to the polls all over the state. They had live entertainment just beyond the minimum distance from polling locations mandated by the new rules. The NAACP threatened to sue counties that allowed frivolous lawsuits under provisions of the voting law that allowed unlimited challenges to individual ballots and so much more organization going on to try to get around these laws and to try to ensure success for, well, not ensure success, but ensure a fair election and access to the polls for both candidates, any candidate. Well, I'll have some great guests on to talk about this, how they did it, and what lays ahead for both the United States Senate and Congress as we run up to the in we're in the lame duck session and the holidays. I talk a little bit with Dr. Brian Rosenwald about what might or might not get done during the holidays. But I'll have plenty of guests talking about the the election outcome in Georgia. Let me know who you want to hear from. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. But before I get to both my guests, just a couple things I want to mention and play for you that are in the news from the last 24 hours. First, here is Fox business host. I hesitate to play any Fox host, but Stuart Varney sounds like he's done with Donald Trump. And I think this is important because I have always been saying and thinking that when right wing media personalities turn on Donald Trump, that is the most important factor in him being an old, lonely man ranting into the ballroom at his Florida mansion. And we're starting to see that. He's been a vocal supporter in the past, but Fox News's Stuart Varney absolutely torched the former president and his standing in the Republican Party on Wednesday. Now, this was, of course, before the outcome of the election was determined last night. But here he is. Take it away, Stuart. Stuart. He seems to be losing what used to be his iron grip on the GOP. He still has a hard core of supporters who will follow him regardless. But many of the 74 million people who voted for him in 2020 have been turned off. Right after that election, the 2020 deal, he ranted against Georgia's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, because he wouldn't fix the vote in Trump's favor. Kemp went on to trounce Donald Trump's guy in the gubernatorial primary. In the midterms, Trump-backed candidates lost vital races. Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, Don Baldock in New Hampshire, Tudor Dixon in Michigan, Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, Carrie Lake in Arizona. And right before today's election, he was talking about terminating parts of the Constitution. That plays right into the Democrats' hands. 
He's trying to walk it back today, but the damage has been done. A win by Raphael Warnock would cement the Democrats' control of the Senate, making it much easier for them to confirm judges and other top officials. If Walker wins, Trump will take all the credit, guaranteed. If Walker loses, Trump will blame Walker for not inviting Trump into the state. Here's a warning from the Wall Street Journal, editorial board, no less. If the Republicans make Trump their candidate in 2024, he won't terminate any part of the Constitution. Quotes, what he's really terminating is the GOP. Wow, there you go. Stuart Varney yesterday on Fox Business. Okay, just want to mention a few other news stories because you do listen to this podcast daily, and then we'll get to both of my guests. First of all, I follow a few epidemiologists on Twitter and subscribe to their emails, of course, Megan May, but also uh, Dr. Caitlin Jetalina, who in her December 6th dispatch, State of Affairs, writes, the dreaded and much anticipated triple-demic is finally here. For the first time, RSV, flu, and COVID-19 are rising together, and it's not looking pretty. She said in her reaction to the latest CDC updates, the data looks pretty clear, and holy crap, there are a lot of sick people in the United States right now. The level truly unprecedented, she writes. We've never seen such high levels of influenza-like illnesses at this time of year. Apparently, the CDC director said yesterday that hospitalizations are the highest now than they have been in the past decade. Truly concerning, given a backdrop of burnt-out healthcare workers and low staff levels. So, Wanted to mention that depressing news, RSV, flu and COVID rising and certain places bringing back mask mandates, which I think is a good suggestion if you're going to be in or around a lot of people. And uh, really, really important news right there from Dr. Caitlin Jetalina. And I wanted to share that. But here's the good news. San Francisco has banned killer police robots for right now is a headline I saw. And no northern giant hornets have been found in 2022 in the state of Washington. So Aaron, the farmer, you should be all right. Well, at least in terms of not being stung by a killer hornet. Kanye West went on Gavin McGinnis's show. So I think he's out of people that are of any prominence that will have him on. And Gavin McGinnis can, uh, d- failed to convince him not to be a Nazi. And finally, the most important story of the day, I th- think, or at least the most gratifying, I don't know, outside of. A lot of other stories that were important. The family of fallen U.S. Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick snubbed Republican leaders Senator Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy at a ceremony held to honor law enforcement who defended the U.S. Capitol during the January 6, 2021 insurrection. If you didn't see that video, I highly recommend it. I watched it about 400 times. The families just walked by them and and McConnell had his dumb hand out and they refused to shake it. They talked about it later on. Why? And I highly recommend uh, you go listen or or, or dig those up if you're interested. But now I'm going to get to my guess. I did. There was one more story I saw this morning early that apparently the police responded to Ted Cruz's home where a 14 year old there girl apparently had self-inflicted stab wounds and This is just absolutely terrible. I absolutely hate Ted Cruz, but I can't imagine what it's like to have him as as my father. And I'm not making a connection there. And I don't know if it was his daughter, but I have a 15 year old daughter and I don't wish that on my worst, worst enemy. So I hopefully uh, she's okay. And I'm not making any jokes or saying anything more about that other than being a decent and good person in reaction to that terrible news about that poor young person, whoever it was. I'm sure, sadly, we're going to learn a lot more about it, but it would be I think it's wrong to uh, dance around in glee, make jokes or comments about any of it. It's a minor. We shouldn't be talking about her and we certainly shouldn't be taking any kind of joy out of such a horrible situation. All right. That's all I've got for you in the news. Now it's time to get to my guests and also take a moment to encourage you to subscribe to this podcast. I put it out every day. Most days I've got two guests and some type of recap on the news, except for on Fridays, because on Thursday nights I hang out with listener subscribers, which is tomorrow night. I hope to see you there at 8 p.m. if you're a subscriber, but you got to sign up now for as little as five bucks a month. Come on, join us. Stand up with Pete dot com patreon.com slash pete dominic hope to see you there tomorrow night can't do this show without your support so please sign up now and it's time to get to my first guest he is an author an academic 
a writer, and someone who's become a good friend of mine. He's the author of American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Before that, he wrote, The Man They Wanted Me to Be, Toxic Masculinity and a Crisis of Our Making. And his new book, out and available January 17th, you can pre-order it now. It's called The Midnight Kingdom. A history of power, paranoia, and the coming crisis. Jared Yates Sexton, jysexton.com, at jysexton on Twitter. And here we go. I left a little bit of our bullshitting before I was officially starting on here for you because I thought it was kind of funny. And, of course, we talked yesterday before the outcome of the election, so we don't really talk about the results. But let's do it right now with my friend Jared Yates Sexton. Wait, did something happen recently where I should follow an epidemiologist? The fact that they became media stars is something that we should talk more about. It's fascinating, actually. No, because there, there's very few of them that are any good at talking because that's, that's not usually that, that part of the problem was the public. I think there's I think there's a larger conversation to be had about academics in that regard, too. Sure. Because they don't they, they have no idea how to talk to other people whatsoever. Well, I'd like to know what you mean by that, because I actually don't <laughs> think I know. Oh, yeah. I think that's actually one of the bigger problems in the country. Well, yeah, right you now. work in academia. Something okay. Like that? I just tweeted you, so I might as well tell you. I said when I, to your tweet about crisscrossing America, I was like, I'll meet you somewhere. So we're going to do you want to do an event? Yeah. Well, let's do a thing for sure. Do I'm wanna, in. Do you want, do you want to, do you want to do like a little mini tour together? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I won't commit. I'm very non committal. You're scaring me. Let's do a thing and okay. see how our bodies stack up against each other because they've never been in the same room. You are you are saying some things that I am into. Well, I'm saying if I if if I meet <laughs> you in person and I find out you're six seven, or I'm, or I find out you're very tiny, well, it'd be even worse. And if how I'm, tall do you think I am? I think that you're six feet. I am just uh, an eyelash shorter than six feet. Yeah, I nailed it. Of course, I did. I could tell. What are you? I am four three. I believe it. Put you in my pocket. I have, want to do this tour in a baby Bjorn. <laughs> All right, I'm recording. Here we go. Okay, let's go. There he is, Jared Yates, sex and everybody. And it's been too long. I'm happy to see your face. The book is almost out. You're ramping up. Everybody else is winding down their year and you're ramping up to promote and talk about the release of your brand new book, which I've just told everybody about congratulations first of all on this very excited for the midnight kingdom a history of power paranoia and the coming crisis jared yates sexton everybody thanks buddy it's good to see you i have a lot of things a lot of things to talk with you about sir first of all what is your overall take you've been tweeting and writing about it at the outcome of the midterm elections what does it mean what are your big takeaways jared you know, um, first of all, I want to go ahead and plug uh, Pete Dominic, the hardest working man in show business, came on the Muckrake podcast. It's out, I guess, probably yesterday as of now. We oh, I haven't little, seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. We've talked a little bit about that uh, on, on there, but I felt like you, you said that you felt like it was the time where the Republican Party went too far. And I think that that's accurate to an extent. Their, their media strategy and their political strategy was basically to get in people's faces and say, they're making your kids into kittens at kitty litter. Yes. You know, like, like, and, and, and quite frankly, people are like, oh, that, that doesn't feel good. That's, that sucks. And they basically unloaded the clown car show. And I think what we saw was that the American people said, you know what, we're not particularly fond of the Democratic Party. We, we wish that they had some answers. We wish they had some direction. But my God, we're not going to vote for Herschel Walker. And we're not going to vote for Dr. Oz. And we're not going to vote for Carrie Lake. And what we realized was that Trumpism and MAGAism and whatever we want to call it is not an electoral strategy. It's a political ideology for other purposes. But I, I, I agree. I think it was I, it gave me hope that maybe our electorate is becoming more complicated and nuanced and understands that there's a problem here. Um, I, I think it was a breath. I think it was a breath before a larger sort of. Let, me, let me stand up for the Democratic Party, which you kind of just poo pooed, because I would say maybe there's part of it. Do you think, Jared, there's part of it was that people came out to reward Democrats for accomplishing a lot in the first two years of the Biden presidency? 
No, you do not I think that. No, I don't at all. I actually young you people, know, I, all these young people. No. Well, here's the thing that young people don't trust the Democratic Party and they don't trust them, I think, for specific reasons. I think the winner of the night um, of, of, of this entire thing was John Fetterman. And I think what became very clear very quickly was that somebody like Fetterman and, and by the way, people people flock to him despite all of the media stories about his health and is he capable of serving? And people said, hey, guess what? We, we've got people in our families who had strokes. We have people in our family who look a lot like John Fetterman. It became very clear, I think, very quickly where the Democratic Party should move, which is in the direction of Fetterman's. But I, I think the exit polls, I think a lot of the mixed results show that uh, people don't necessarily trust either of the parties, but they especially don't trust like this cold garbage. that. So what do you think? Are. My understanding was that I mean, maybe I'm reading the wrong things, but that there's a, a lot of young people came out. Not And, and for, well, what do you th- is that your understanding? And if so, what did they come out to vote for or against or what motivated that vote? Yeah, a a lot of young people did come out because, quite frankly, um, I don't think that they feel good about the directions of things, but I think that they know that the Republican Party was the wrong direction. They're voting against they were voting against the party uh, that just removed women's reproductive rights in many states. Yeah. and, And one of the things that we see in midterm elections, particularly when it comes to Congress, of course, is we see that a lot of the victories are won on a national platform. It's we are the party of this. Vote us in. Give us power. We will do this. The Democratic Party doesn't have that. Um, It is almost impossible to define who the Democrats are at this point, except for in opposition to the Republicans. And I think that uh, a lot of these split tickets, a lot of these split legislatures, a lot, you know, split power in general, I think shows that, yeah, they weren't going to reward the Democratic Party, but they certainly uh, sure as hell were not going to help the Republican Party. So. Are you less concerned? Does this change anything about your calculus, the the way that that people voted? We can get into the courts. We can get into Congress. We can get into media and Kanye West and Elon Musk buying Twitter and all the things that matter. They're important. But did the outcome of the election change your calculus at all about the future? Um, you know, it, it sort of showed me a little bit of, of where we are in terms of how the people are reacting to these things. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think right now. In America, in China, Iran, around the world, what we're seeing is the growth of like a democratic people's movement, which is basically people saying we're tired of being exploited. We're tired of all this nonsense. We're tired of a top down approach. And I think what this election showed was that there are a lot of people who are taking this stuff seriously. I mean, you you think about it the past six years, Pete, we've been we've been talking to each other for uh, a chunk of years now. We've been following this for a chunk of years. Yeah. A lot of people who were not paying attention to politics now are like, oh my God, this is something I have to pay attention to. Because if not, Kerry Lake's going to come around and not certify an election. If not, they're going to not just take away Roe v. Wade, they're going to take away civil rights. I think it has shown that the populace is is mobilizing around this democratic people's movement. What concerns me, though, is that authoritarians don't just say, hey, we lost the election. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Um, It is now moving away from democratic actions and tools and towards other methods of trying to gain power. And that that's sort of what concerns me. Yeah. Lots of other methods to gain power. And they're doing a pretty good job in the courts. Although if we win, if Democrats win, I say we for sure tonight, it'll make it that much better for Democrats to get more progressive justices in the final two years of Biden's presidency up and down throughout the courts, which is a pretty big deal, I guess. Uh, And that's what I wanted to ask you about. What about this Supreme Court? And we talk we can talk about somehow taking over a state house legislature with progressive legislators, policymakers, or we can talk about the media. But things keep ending up at the Supreme Court and bad things are tending to happen. So how do you see it? Well, first of all, the Supreme Court has always been a a regressive institution. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was given the powers that it had and the authority it had to make sure that you know, the, the the whims of the powerful were going to win out over any democratic impulses. It's it's no coincidence that the court became what it was as the idea of democracy started to take place in America. Um, with that, I have to tell you that appointing more justices is absolutely important, but it we need somebody who's going to take this stuff head on. We need somebody like an FDR to talk about court packing. We need a leader who's basically says, hey, you've made your ruling, now you need to enforce it. Because what has happened is the Supreme Court has not only been stolen, but its authoritarian, minoritarian elements have come into play. And even if you pass some sort of a progressive agenda at this point, they'll kill it. You know what I mean? Like, that's what they're there for. 
And so the Republican Party isn't that interested in winning elections as long as they're able to take advantage of these minoritarian institutions that are tuned for their advantage. Yes. Yeah, well, that's for sure. And we could take any one of the issues out of that from LGBT rights to gun rights yep. or lack of gun rights. You've been writing about that over at the old Substack. all these horrific and violent epidemic of mass shootings. Obviously, we always should be talking about suicide, homicide and all the different kinds of gun violence accidents. And I mean, that's the one that worries me the most about the courts is that even when we make changes it's hard to keep those changes even at the state level because samuel leto is like yosemite sam i i man he is uh he's the embarrassment that keeps embarrassing yeah I mean, indeed. it's bad and and i will say on on the subject of guns and this is something else that we need to discuss and you know we've we've touched on this in our in our previous discussions Something has to happen with the individual and also with, and and I'm sorry to say this, this is a loaded word, the soul of this country. Mm. Like a large reason why we have the the epidemic of gun violence, one of the reasons we have the authoritarian elements that we do is because the soul of this country has been so corrupted and so perverted that uh, individualism and also a lack of meaning have combined with things like, you know, masculine insecurity and, and, and white supremacy. Like these things, like you could take the guns, which you absolutely should. Um, you can do any number of things to to limit these deals. But until America has like an actual moment of like spiritual like introspection, I mean, there's there's no end to how these things are going to express themselves. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have a purpose and a meaning and friends, it's really easy to find online. And sometimes you find awesome friends and an awesome group of people and your life is, is better. That certainly has been the case for me and probably a lot of people. I mean, people meet online and they get married, but sometimes you find a bad group of people and it's really easy to find them. And we know, and you've written about this, they're looking for you (laughs) the same way the United States army wants yeah. you the best of the brightest so does your local militia white supremacist christian nationalist group they're eyeing you like hey, come on over here check out our one of our meetings you like uh, you like my t-shirt huh the one with the waving flag and eagle and and gun on it you should come by we're having a what are what are they having i don't know what they're having I mean, listen, something absolutely repulsive is what they're having. I, I, I mean, I just about said boiled hot dogs. I have a, I have a spot in my heart for boiled hot dogs. What am I saying? Yeah, what are but you no. going to criticize? There's no, there's no junk food that you can tie to a person to dehumanize them the way I'm, yeah. I'm basically doing, which I don't mean to be doing because we have to treat them like humans because you've eaten all those foods on a regular basis. Oh, absolutely. It's the song of my people. But I'll also go ahead and I'll say, you know, when these mass shootings happen, hardly ever do you read an article it's like he had so many friends and 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 he was so good with our family and like he was always out and about and being with other people it's so shocking what has actually happened is that this nihilistic um white supremacist patriarchal energy online has managed to create a place where a bunch of men a bunch of white men by the way who are frustrated they don't have anybody else they're not taking care of themselves um, whether it's mental illness or abuse or trauma or any of those things, they manifest and basically they find a group of people who are radicalized and then spread that radical contagion. It is a problem that we, you know, this you're in the media. Like it's, it's like this thing where everybody just sort of like has this song and dance. They say, Oh, this happened. Who could ever possibly imagine this? And then they move on. We never talk about like what is actually happening, like on the granular personal right. level. And we self. don't. And then that, Granule moves down the hill, becomes a boulder and walks into a church, a synagogue, a school and destroys families and communities permanently. And we have to have that conversation, which is what you and I are going to do, because we're going to you you tweeted that you're going to spend next year crisscrossing the nation and and organizing and networking. And I'm not sure what your plan is, but I will meet you somewhere and I will have a list of uh, things that I'm going to need that place to, you know, be able to list of comforts, the brown M and M's, if you will. No, I mean like the place, like it has to be near lakes and rivers or something, you know, like I like that. Yeah, like a cabin. Me, you, a branding iron, and some light beer. What? 
Now, I know I love this radical honesty and openness and vulnerability that we're showing. No, I, you know, <laughs> I've reached this point and it's one of those things where, you know, I've spent the last six years researching what's wrong. You know, I really yeah. wanted to understand the problem and the trajectory of things. And, you know, I'm still going to talk about where this stuff came from and I'm still going to try and educate when it comes to like history and politics. But I want to get in the fight. I, 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 I think that the answer lies because, quite frankly, and, and we talk about this a lot. So much of the discussion of this stuff lies in profit motive, right? Like building up your profit base, your customer base, and all that. Basically, it's MLM all the way down with a lot of these people. You know <laughs> what I mean? And I, I don't want to sit here and just be like, hey, here are the answers. I hope somebody else has them. And, and you inspired me, uh, to be honest. Like when you started getting involved in, in your local scene, and there's a couple of other people I felt like kind of showed me the way on this. Like, I I was lucky enough to be an academic for years. Like, I was able to learn research skills. I was able to gain access to a bunch of tools so I could put together the answers for myself. Yeah. I'm from a really poor background. And the poor background is the same background that is now creating the problem that we're talking about, yeah. the authoritarianism and radicalization. I want to be able to go in these places because I truly do believe that solidarity and community building is what's important. Yeah. And I'm, I'm tired of just sitting in the stands and spectating on what's happening. I want to go out. I want to create these communities and structures. I want to find new leaders. I want to put pressure on the status quo and, and see what happens. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great for you to get out and, and, and get field experience. It'd be great for anybody to do that. And, you know, most of us, probably don't have the ability to, to go across the country, but you can do that in your community. You can go into a neighborhood that is not yours, that doesn't look like you. And yeah, that was my favorite thing to do in New York city. It's still one of my favorite things to do. I love going into neighborhoods and I just interviewed Jeff Charlotte. I'm thinking about him going in all these rural neighborhoods in Wisconsin and taking pictures of their fascist flags and then, <laughs> then them inviting a vanity fair writer <laughs> award-winning sure. author into their homes. And I, th I think you're going to, I think you'll be great at that same type of work. Well, and I want to say, first of all, if anybody listening wants me to come to their, their place, get a hold of your bookstore and tell them, bring in, bring me in. I'm going to be driving around in my car. I will come. Oh yeah. You're going to be talk. doing a book tour anyway. Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm going to fold this thing in. And, and with that on the secondary part of this, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about how academics are siloed away from the public. Mm, yeah, you know, right. I, I, I have known a lot of academics who are specialists. They understand a lot of information. They're only talking to each other. And if they go into the community, they're going in to tell the community what to do. The answer at this point, I want to go in and I want to listen. Yeah, I want I want to know what's happening with people. I want to discuss things. I want to offer up my services and say, how can I play a role in it? And a large part of this for a long time, it's elitist, it's classist, it's regional, you name it. It's a bunch of people who either have no interest in going out and talking to people, right? Because they're siloed in the white walls of, of academia, or they have no idea how to. And, and listen, I love academics. I, I, they're, they're, they're my people as well. But I have to tell you, they're not great at getting out and talking to people, largely because yeah. of class differences, regional differences, you name it. But it's time that a lot of us who have this information and have the skills that we do to go out and listen. Because quite frankly, look at the labor movement, Pete. People are with no experience, no education, no help are organizing and they are stifling Amazon, Starbucks, Apple, you name it. They are holding up through labor and through solidarity. They're stacking up W's against some of the most powerful corporations in the history of, of, of humanity. Well, you out there yeah. doing that kind of work would be really interesting. I'm excited for wherever you go on your book tour. So people should go to their local bookstore and say, bring Jared Yates Sexton here for a, a talk. And then I think they should have you over and make you a chili. I bet you a lot of listeners of mine will invite you to their homes. I bet you they will. I would happily. Uh, I go to their after, homes. I went after to a quick background check and Pete like vouching for you. I'll come to your home and eat chili. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would vouch for them. Most likely I'd have to, if you're going to go to their home, but I went to hang out with a bunch of listeners that I've gotten to know. So it was cool. I got to know them pretty well over the years. And uh, one of them plays quarterback and he threw, I want to play catch with him. And he threw, we didn't have a football. So he threw a volleyball at, at my face and my head very hard, hit me right in the head. 
Well, I, you know, Pete, when I look at you, I see a world class athlete. I'm very surprised by this. Well, yeah, no, I am, but this guy was better than I can. And, you know, the point is, my listeners just peg me with balls. Well, and, and, and by the way, on that note, and I want <laughs> to be fun. Sincere, it was very fun. I want to be sincere about this. And again, you've inspired me a lot in so many different ways, but I want to point this out. And I want to, I love pulling back the curtain because we have to do it now. If we're going to build something important, if we're going to be the answer to a lot of these problems, we have to pull back the curtain and actually talk about motivations. We have to talk about relationships. What we do with podcast, with media, with all of it, and I hope you don't mind me talking about this, the system sets it up for what's called parasocial relationships. Yeah. Right? They listen to you every day. They listen to the Muckrake podcast yeah. every Tuesday and Friday, or they hang out with me on a Sunday for a bourbon talk. We approach it, and I know you do, because I've seen you with your community and the people who listen to you. You approach it from actual integrity and vulnerability. You want to have intimate relationships with these people because you value that. As much as I can, as, mu as much, you know, as much as I, as I can allow, I mean, there's always boundaries, but for sure, yeah, go ahead. Right, and that's what I'm saying is like, it is one of those things where I talk all the time about like the muckrake community or whatever. It's important to me that like, we're not just doing this because we're selling a product. You know what I'm talking about? And like, it's, Trump's this way, Trump Jr.'s this way. All of those grifters do that. They're creating parasocial relationships with yeah. people that they think are absolute dupes and they're trying to manipulate. I think it's time to start being vulnerable. I Right now, I am practicing radical honesty and radical openness. Mm -hmm. It's changing my life in ways sure. that I don't... Yeah, it, it, it's changed everything about my life in every single possible way. And what I have found is... Um, and, and, and by the way, I, <laughs> I gotta tell you... I got scammed online for a couple of dollars because I was trying to be like helpful. <laughs> wow, what happened? Well, I, okay, I'll tell you the quick story. I'm doing this radical openness, radical empathy, all of it. And I saw somebody online say something about like they couldn't afford something. And I was like, tell me your PayPal. And somebody swooped in immediately with like a fake account and like got it. And that was, that was one of those moments we have to be careful. Right. We have to protect ourselves. Oh, but look also, at you. That was thoughtful of you. But though. Also, nothing is going to change if we keep going down the path of neoliberal competition. Right. Yeah. Where yeah. where yeah. I can't talk to Pete Dominic because me and Pete Dominic are competitors. He's trying to get yeah. one over on me. I'm trying to get one over on you. Yeah. And when that really takes over a culture and you know this, it happens in families. Where people can't trust each other in families, they become economic competitors. We have to start, and I keep talking about this, we have to chance looking foolish. We have to chance the possibility that, you know, somebody might try and get one over on us or whatever, because we have to learn how to trust one another again in order to build movements. Well, and, listen, and you made that clear and you inspired me in that regard. I yeah, I mean, I, that is really unbelievably uh, kind of you to say, but I have taking a chance looking stupid from from age 17 so i started there as a comic and i didn't believe in the competition bullshit which is why when i was in corporate media i was opening the door to as many people as i could to corporate media and when i was shown the door out to corporate media i reaped the benefits of that by the way because i believe in collaboration and not competition and i certainly believe in and practice as much radical vulnerability as I have been able to. And that's also been something that has helped me connect with so many other people from all kinds of different backgrounds, which is why I'm excited to do anything with you anywhere. We got to find a place bookstore. I'll interview you and then we'll go out and there'll be a band made up of listeners. Probably. I guess I love it. I I'm, I'm all for it. And I got to tell you, I think what you just said is really important. What I have noticed in doing this is, yeah, you're going to get screwed every now and then you're going to get your heart broken every now and then that that's <laughs> how radical openness works. But like when you're in that, well, like when you're in self and you're like leading through courage and curiosity and all these things, the universe like helps you. I, I one of the the mantras that I've been using lately is when things aren't good and you're trying to control life, it feels like you're trying to hold the ocean. It swamps you. It it it, it will drown you. But when you're good and when you're actually like in that space, the ocean wants to be held. It you know it it's helping you help it. And I feel like I have been having so many good conversations with people. I have been 
so honest about this stuff that like people come out of the woodwork and they're like, how can I help you? How can, you know, what is it that we can do? Yeah. And, and all of a sudden it's not, it's not that paranoid part, which by the way is what the right wing feeds off of. Like Republicans, the right wing, this authoritarian movement, it's about taking advantage of people being scared. It's about yeah, taking yeah. advantage of people being paranoid and people being lonely and feeling powerless. And they take advantage of that for power and for well, it's wealth. it's also about, you've mentioned it, um, this can be anywhere on the spectrum, but a very American competition, 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 as if I've got to beat you because there's yep. not enough for all of us or just because ego wise. And that's, you know, very male thing, of course, that we can we can talk about. But I I think I recognized that really young. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to I'm going to try to be. I had people do it for me, I should say, to be honest with you. I had a bunch of comedians that did really nice, generous things for me. Steve Byrne, Greg Giraldo. Steve Byrne got me my agent. Greg Giraldo got me in the comedy cellar. I could go on and on. Rory Albany's got me hired at The Daily Show. I mean, I could go on. And I was like, if, I, if I'm not doing that for everybody, bringing but them... Isn't it, yeah. isn't it also... Because I want to... I, I, and I'm, I've always been fascinated by the comedian subculture, right? And tell me if I'm correct here. In the understanding that I have about the comedian subculture, when y'all meet, because you're a very specific type of person, you know what I mean? Like there's 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 something that leads to people becoming comedians. I, I'm a writer. When I meet other writers, I recognize in them a loneliness that I have. Well, right? I mean, I don't love the archetypes because they leave a lot of people like me out. I feel like I don't fit into a lot of those categories. So I bristle at the comparison, I at the, gen you, but, the gener uh, g generalization. But it's go not ahead. that, though. It's not about the, the stereotype. Once you move beyond stereotypes, you have a conversation and it's not about like you, ch you check this box off, you check this box off. We go through life mostly seeing strangers and thinking of them as being like kind of non-living entities that are in our way. Do you know what I mean? Like they're there to like make me late for things. <laughs> they're going to keep me from getting the things that I want. But then when you have like a, a moment of intimacy and again, like I always walk away from like our conversations. I feel energized. You know what I mean? I feel good because I see you as a person. I see your heart. I feel who you are. When you have moments of intimacy with other people, all of a sudden something clicks into your brain. And this is the opposite of authoritarianism. And this is the opposite of capitalism and consumerism and neoliberalism. When you have an intimate moment with another person, you're like, oh, my God, this is a living person. This is a person who has sure. like wants yeah. and needs and insecurities. And oh, my God, sometimes they'll hurt me, but it's not because they're evil. It's because they're insecure in the same way that I am. You know what I mean? And it's the give and the take. And in subcultures, you can sort of bond over vocations or interests or hobbies it's that harder. make that. Yeah, but it's just, I mean, I'm just going to to like give you an example to react to. It's harder to do that if it's me or, or you to a guy who sleeps between two AR-15s and under a Gadsden flag yeah. blanket. That's hard to go in there and find common ground because a lot of these guys are very radicalized and activated and... It's very tough to de-radicalize an Al-Qaeda member or a Oath Keeper. It is. And by the way, that goes back to taking care of yourself. I People ask me all the time, because I wrote this book on masculinity. By the way, I'm getting a real kick. It, it just, it makes me happier and shit that like I come on this show, we're talking about current events, and the next thing I know we're talking about spirituality. It's Let's like go. One of the best Let's go. Going. But it's, you know, you, people ask me all the time, they're like, I have a brother or a husband or a father who is like a toxic, abusive yeah. male. And they're like, how do I, how do I change this? And the first answer is always, you need to be safe, right? Because this person is in a place where they are dangerous and they could possibly harm you. You have to be safe. But then you have to start to break down those like things that make them like that, whether it's insecurities or a terror that they have. And by the way, we all know this. We see some white dude carrying around an AR-15. The first thing we think is, oh, that person is very sad. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. First of all is I hope they don't shoot me. Number two, oh, my God, they're yeah. so sad. Yeah, I usually don't think they've got a lot of yeah. gas in the tank. You know, and, and you just kind of look at them and you're like, oh, my God, that's so sad. Yeah. I It, it is hard dealing with radicalized people to see the humanity in it. And that's why... We can do work with those people if we're safe, but first we need to get safe, which means having real conversations with the people who aren't like that. 
there's way more of us than there are of yep. them. And they win when we're not able to talk to each other, when they're able to control our conversations, when they're able to make us terrified to the point where even so-called liberals are like, you know what, just take control and power as long as I can protect my money and my property. That's fine. That's fine. Just leave me alone. I don't have to interact with other people. Matter of fact, ship off the homeless people, you know, lock up the homeless people, all that stuff. It has to involve the safety of our numbers and the safety of starting to change ourselves through solidarity. I think that's the only means that this thing actually gets done. Yeah, well, it starts somewhere and I'm excited to see what you're going to do and where you're going to go. And I hope we'll be able to continue the conversation this way or even in person, maybe for the first time it would be, I think. I, I I think it would be fantastic to hang out. I think uh, the intimacy might be uncomfortable for some people. We might have some long glances across the room at one another. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I want to see what your hands look like. <laughs> you can tell a lot, I think. I think I think this is this is what the people are clamoring for, Pete. It's, yeah, it's not it's not incisive political analysis and current events. It's looking at each other's the people hands know. and making inferences. the people know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. Jared, thank you very much. You're the best, Pete. <laughs> hey, bud. All right, there he goes, Jared Yates Sexton. I hope you liked that conversation and that you will consider going to pre-order his new book, everybody, and just go to Jared Yates Sexton, jysexton.com for more information or just go uh, look up The Midnight Kingdom, a history of power paranoia and the coming crisis and pre-order it. Then let him know that you heard him here on Twitter. Give him a follow if you haven't already. And I'm looking forward now to sharing with you my next conversation I had with uh, Dr. Brian Rosenwald, who is a political historian, specializes in the role of media in shaping of popular cultures. He's the sen- senior editor of Made by History, a Washington Post history section. He's currently a scholar in residence at Ivy League University of Pennsylvania, my safety school, where he teaches courses in history and political science. His book is Talk Radio's America, How an Industry Took Over a Political Party That Took Over the United States. And we caught up at the end of last week, again, before the outcome of the election last night. We had a great conversation, talked about his new Substack, which he's just launched. And he wrote about the railway railroad strike and more. The World According to Brian, brianrosenwald.substack.com. If you want to subscribe to that, let's do it. There he is, Dr. Brian Rosenwald, and it is great to have you joining me again. It's been far too long, but I'm psyched to have you. Congratulations on the launch of your Substack. I've always loved talking to you, your books. I love following you on Twitter. But now I get these bite-sized chunks of what your thoughts are about politics and more. Music and sports, which you also tweet about. You're a Philadelphia guy. So this is very exciting, and I want to get right into it, talking with you about the yet unreleased Maybe it'll be published by the time I post this piece because uh, it's important to talk about super relevant. You're about to put this out on your new Substack about the railroads. Thank you for joining me. Good to see you. Let's get into it. Always good to be with you, Pete. And yeah, I have the, the post I'm playing, I haven't figured out exactly what day I want to drop it yet. Right. In the end of the week, things get weird. Yep. But th- there was this really interesting vote yesterday on an amendment to add the way it works. There, there's a law that lets Congress enforce railroads to take some sort of contract railroad workers and railroads to take a contract essentially the theory is the railroads are too essential to the american economy to have a work stoppage there would be all kinds of catastrophic damage and so joe biden who was on the record earlier in his career is not even liking this law reluctantly asked congress to force a settlement on the railroad workers that they their bosses agree to the union bosses agree to it and eight of the 12 unions ratified it. The other four did not. And the big sticking point is sick leave. This agreement provided them with a measly one day of sick leave. It's pretty pathetic and shameful. And so the, there was no way they were going to pass this agreement through a Democratic Congress without having some shot at adding sick leave. So the House passed an amendment to add seven days of sick leave. And then the Senate, we saw some really weird things he, things I, I wasn't sure I'd ever see, like Bernie Sanders and Ted Cruz fist bumping. No. Yeah. Bernie told Cruz, I knew you were a socialist. 
But is that the, right? The Are you this, joking? Yeah. No, that that's right. That's what no, happened. Did Bernie, uh, I, I believe they fist bumped. Did, did Bernie really say I didn't know you were a socialist, or was that your joke? I saw that on Twitter. I wish it was my joke. Oh, okay. I, I, okay. I don't know for sure it happened, but it sounds like something Bernie would say. Sure. Yeah. And, I love it. But um, go, so go so, ahead. Yeah. So the, there were th- this vote was really weird for the Republicans. And I actually started writing this a few days before the vote, kind of seeing this coming. You've got a group of Republicans, Josh Hawley being the leader of them, who understands that the future of their party is white working class voters. Most of them married, most of them Christian, a lot of, you know, and then they have opportunities with Latino and some African-American, especially men, um, younger men, that they can pull them into their coalition because they're losing the suburbs over culture issues and they need a new base. The problem is that for all that they love to scream about awful, evil, woke corporations, and they want to do things to the tech companies. And Josh Hawley is really especially pushing, you know, protectionism and immigration restrictions. They're not really offering much else in the way of a policy agenda. They're not offering things right. that are going to make people's lives better. So here they are presented with a very simple vote. Do railroad workers get seven days of paid sick leave, which I think we all kind of think is a good idea because who, let's be honest, Pete, who wants to be the guy who goes to work and the guy next to you is like hacking up a lung because he can't afford to take the day off. Like, Especially if he's working on the railroad. I mean, I, I don't want right. to make any jokes about the safety issues that that creates. But, yeah, you want your yeah, people to be healthy if, they're, if you're working near them. I mean, you want people to work on railroads to be to be healthy. But just the, just the humanity of it. Like, are we really arguing over seven right. days uh, of sick leave? Right, right. Pri- we're, yeah. we're, we're talking about something very minor. Other countries, so, I believe, this, you know, that we could talk about all the other nations that have it as part of their their, their law. Yeah. That you have yeah, to, every I mean, company has to guarantee, and the government jobs guarantee sick leave several days, certainly more than a week. Right. I mean, and so th- this shouldn't have been that big of a deal. But so you got this really strange bedfellows coalition of these, this small group of Republicans who want to understand where their political future is and saw an opportunity here. It was it, Hawley, uh, Ted Cruz. John Kennedy from Louisiana, the the former like Rhodes Scholar who likes to pretend he's some sort of homespun, Ugh. you know, backwoods guy. He stinks. Lindsey Graham, um, Mike Braun, uh, Mike Braun, and I'm forgetting who the sixth was. Marco Rubio. Here, oh. here's the tweet. Oh, uh, Rubio. Rubio was the one. Democratic I Senator Rubio Joe Manchin voted against adding sick leave into the rail workers deal to avoid a nationwide strike. Republicans, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham, John Kennedy and Mike Braun joined Democrats in voting. Yes, you said also uh, that uh, Holly did. And then he adds of note, Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders fist bumped. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so you've got th- Rubio and Holly are pushing this kind of thing. And Cruz is just an opportunist who wants to be on whatever side he thinks is, is the future politically. But w- what I thought was interesting about this vote is it highlights a real conundrum for Republicans. Eventually, if you're going to be a conservative populist party, you're going to be the party of the working class. You've got to start acting like it. And, and Hawley gets it. Hawley tried to, after the fact, blame Joe Biden for this, you know, how awful Joe Biden is at betraying the workers and everything like this. Which is sort of ridiculous when you consider, and I'm going to get the statistic wrong, but there were, I think there were three Democrat senators who didn't vote. So 46 of the 47 Democrats who voted, voted for this. Whereas I think there were 48 Republicans who voted and it was like six of 48. So like, which of these parties seems more responsible for this? It it shouldn't be close. But like Hawley tried to hit Biden for this saying, you know, Joe Biden only cares about the people who can remote work and all this other stuff. But he also said, you know, anytime D.C. Republicans would actually like to do the right thing or something like that, you know, he hit his own party on this as well. And I think that you're going to see this tension rising increasingly that Republicans have changed rhetorically to be a populist party and they go after the tech companies and things like that. But they don't really have a populist agenda. And the most of the people who are in office for the Republicans are still these Reaganites. They want less government, low taxes. You know, this railroad workers vote was like the antithesis of what they believe in the government forcing private companies to provide a benefit like that, that they hate that kind of thing. Yeah. As long as you have that. It's a really interesting development as to the way that they're thinking they have to shift somehow towards working class folks. Bernie Sanders 
by the way, has been all over this, as you say. I'm, I'm over there looking at his Twitter feed. He's like, you ready for a really radical idea? Firing a worker because they're sick and can't come to work. That's radical. What's not radical? Guaranteeing seven paid sick days to all rail workers in America. Let's get it done. I mean, the dude's always been on top of this. But yeah, Republicans pick and choose which private giant corporations or small businesses that they want to pick on. And then they pick on them and then act like they're pro-business. I mean, they always want to have it five different ways. It's preposterous. Right. And especially because here they're picking on these companies more rhetorically. They they don't actually want to do a lot of they they don't have a populist agenda. And my thing is, if they don't get one, they have a real problem politically because they're losing the suburbs on culture there. You know, as we saw in the midterm elections, they are really, really, really bleeding in the suburbs. And so they have to get votes somewhere. And my theory is that eventually the working class voters are going to say, well, what are you doing for us? What have you actually delivered that makes my life better? Sure, you, I, I guess you can say that they've kept your, your kids in school from reading porn, Pete. You know, they, they have. Yeah, they no, have seriously, they will, they will. Or they'll take credit for things they voted against. Right. They look, look at the new the, the roads and bridges the, and all the infrastructure yeah. investment that we didn't vote for. And they'll take credit for it. <laughs> right. so, yeah. I mean, but, you know, at some point they're going to have to actually listen to Holly and follow his lead in some way here. And it was an interesting vote because I didn't think there was any chance when they for you know beginning of the week, they first started talking about this, like this isn't going to pass. You're not getting 10 Senate Republicans for this. And then all of a sudden Ted Cruz is for it. And, and it really highlighted this gulf between kind of younger, more MAGA oriented Republicans and the Mitch McConnell wing of the party that would never do this to business because they don't they want less government. That's what am their, I missing? their hallmark. What, are, did you ever read into I got I was thinking like trying to get somebody on, but read into the negotiations. Like, what is the big deal over sick days? I I mean, I, I know it, there's a cost there. I get it. It's probably a big cost each day off that you got to pay. Some, but I just I don't understand why that is such a sticking point. And I don't understand how it was negotiated by eight out of 12 unions and approved of before. You know, and why the other I, I never got inside those negotiations. And if you don't know, we, we don't have to talk about it because there's so many other things I, I want to ask you about. I know a little bit, which is that it's they're worried they've cut their workforce to the bone to, to such an extent that I don't think they have the manpower to afford having people out. And it, they're concerned it's going to like interrupt the schedule and screw with, you know, logistics and all kinds of things mm-hmm. nationally. And, and to be clear, this wasn't a bad deal for the railroad workers. They got um 24 percent raise i think in this deal yeah i thought there was some pretty um, good things in it but but there, still there, there's some good things and they did secure for the first time that three times a year they can miss time for a doctor's appointment and you know the, that kind of thing which again it's it's paltry it, it's embarrassing for these multi-million dollar companies yeah to be doing this but my understanding was it wasn't so much that they were being scrooge about it as they're worried about operational impacts that, you know, they don't have enough conductors right. for a guy to call out sick or something. Yeah. I don't, I want to, somebody's got, has written about or writes about regularly. Maybe there's a beat of railroad worker, you know, the, the railroad economics and railroad workers interests. I'd like to, it seems like a pretty, I don't even know what we move on the rails and I have a freight tr- line right at the end of my street, basically my whole house rattles. And I see a lot of, you know, obviously there's a lot of energy supplies uh, and, and chemicals on those trains, coal Ooh. and chemicals and, and oil and, and all kinds of shit that if it ever blew up uh, would incinerate my entire home and family. But you know, I like to point to the fact that they are pretty, they're really safe. We rarely have a railroad accident in in the U.S., for sure, and even around the world. It's a pretty safe way to transport dangerous things, even though it seems like it wouldn't be. But, you know, I, I don't know. I'm interested in it. But I mean, I, I remember reading a story in, like, September about a, a railroad worker who, like, canceled a doctor's appointment because he got called into work. Like, they can get called in sort of unexpectedly and he ended up you know you know where this is going it's one of those tragic stories he ended up dying from a heart attack a few weeks later that you know the doctor's appointment might have prevented that or something like that but so i I read a couple of those kinds of stories you know we we should be clear when because there are probably people listening saying well wait a second this sounds evil why is joe biden forcing these guys no not letting them go on strike and the answer is what you talked about we trap everything gets carried on the our freight rails 
Um, I, I read that if you had a, a, um, a strike, especially before the holidays, first of all, it's going to spike inflation dramatically. Second of all, it could interrupt the water supply in certain places, which is kind of important. But like we're shipping everything on there. Some people won't be able to get medicine. Other people won't be able to get essentials. So, you know, we have this weird system where we have a pretty crappy passenger rail in, in America, but we have really good freight rail. And so it, it was one of those situations where it's integrally tied to all aspects of the economy. You know, there will be small businesses that can't ship their goods to people at the biggest you know, sales time of the year or something yeah. like that. So there was going to be real serious economic impacts. Yeah. And all of Biden's economic advisors were saying, you can't let them walk off the job here. What I would like to see, what I think would be savvy for Biden is to turn around and say to the Democratic leadership in Congress, you know, we only have another month that we control both branches of things. Let's put a bill on the floor that surtaxes any business that has more than, you know, say 50 workers or something like that, that doesn't offer paid sick leave. It, it, it seems like that at the very least you win politically. You look like you're fighting for the average Joe. And the, the thing is, it's Democrats certainly, he's certainly fought for it. He, he certainly fought for a lot more than just paid sick leave in that original version, I think of build back better. And so yeah. you're, t you're basically suggesting take it apart, just pass it as some people suggested it would be more politically sound, you know, piece by piece. And so, yeah, it'd be an interesting, interesting yeah, thing I mean, for Democrats to start the new minority out, you know, or, or go out with their majority on, will they do anything in the yeah, I mean, session? Well, so, okay. The, there are possible things that might happen in the lame duck session, because I think that even a lot of Senate Republicans understand that nothing is going to happen over the next two years, except a, a clown car investigation um, in the into house. the, the yes. Biden's uh, cat. Yes. You know, my favorite tweet was Matt Gates getting very upset uh, last night because, you know, there's this big state dinner for the French president and Biden being a decent human being invites Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise, the, the two Republican leaders. And reporters ask McCarthy, he shows up in his tux and tails with his mother. Yeah. And they ask him, you know, are you comfortable having being at this dinner with Hunter Biden since you think he's like Satan and, you, you know, you want to investigate him left and right? And his answer was, you know, I'm here with my mother. Well, Matt Gates was like, well, you know, if we made Jim Jordan our leader, he would certainly not be dining with Hunter Biden. You know, totally ignoring the context. So I, I, I got to laugh at that. Oh, they're going to paint. They're going to paint Kevin McCarthy over the next few weeks as someone who dines with hunter biden that is hilarious and upsetting yeah i mean you know they're, they're gonna ignore the fact that like it, it was a state dinner you go to those if you get invited well they dine with nick fuentes <laughs> yeah that too i mean they're they're, they're finally off the, the kanye train it only took praising nazis on alex jones's show for them to, to get that far but i mean the House is going to do nothing for like two years. The Senate is therefore just going to confirm judges. So, and you also have an unusually large. That's group not of nothing, Republicans. though, right? Confirming judges. You don't know the judges is, is is important. Yeah, judges is really important. But you have six retiring Republican senators, and then some others who actually care about policy who would probably like to get things done. So this is the this is it. And you have two bills that have to pass this month: the National Defense Authorization Act that they have to pass every year. And then they got to keep the lights on for the government. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to see a lot of stuff get attached to that. One, po the, the sort of most remote or least likely possibility, but still there's some buzz about, is doing something about dreamers. Um, the, those young immigrants uh, who have been here their entire lives, who are productive members of society, and it's insane that we would even think about deporting them. Right. There's been some discussion about the potential for that. Um, there has been talk about doing something about marijuana banking because we have this ridiculously insane system yeah. where the drug is illegal nationally, but all these states are legalizing it and then they can't like use the financial system. Yeah, it's such a. But that's been. Yeah. Yeah, th that's been held up because a lot on the left want to do some criminal justice reform stuff. They're like, we're not just going to help the elites if we do something here. Um, so that is another possibility. They should do the Electoral Count Reform Act to try to prevent another 1-6 situation where somebody thinks that, like, Congress can just throw the results out. So that there's a bipartisan deal on and that may happen. Um, I saw something that Rand Paul is holding up, something about discrimination against pregnant workers, some piece of legislation that's passed the House that has bipartisan support. 
that Paul won't agree to a time agreement. See, the because big thing there, the is, Senate, is it because Rand Paul is upset that there's not enough discrimination against pregnant workers? <laughs> well, it, it gets back to the Republicans uh, favorite <laughs> um, and maybe one of the only two parts of the Constitution that they care about, which is freedom of religion. He's decided that this is some horrible encroachment upon freedom of religion. Um, and the thing with the Senate that people have to understand is because one senator can really muck things up and tie things up, you yeah. tend to need time agreements for anything because otherwise it's going to take, you know, like Bernie, to give you an example, Bernie could have forced them to wait like another four days to pass this bill to keep the railroads open. So they gave him a vote on his amendment and he basically let them go home for the weekend, which is the number one priority for senators always is get out of town for the week. So Rand Paul's not agreeing to a time agreement. So that may get pushed into one of these big bills. So there's all kinds of stuff that's being floated or talked about. The biggest problem is time. You yeah. know, Congress is like, why should we have to work around the holidays? It's not like we take, you know, all this other time off all year or anything like that. But I would think that they stay in secession pretty late into December and try to do this. And then I, I guess the one investigative thing is they finally got the House Ways and Means Committee finally got Trump's tax returns. So we'll see if anything comes out of that at all. Um, and we are going to get a, a final report from the one six committee that they claim is going to have all kinds of new information. So we'll see about that as well. But it could be, you know, it, there was a time Pete, when we were younger, when December was like the, the political reporters could book their vacation safely in December and in August. Yeah. Nothing happened. Yeah. They weren't in session. Well, we're so inefficient as a government now that every year now, December is just a mess. And I mean, some of that is uh, Steve Scalise released the House like calendar for next year. And there's like five months where they're in session, like eight days or less or something like that. Wow. So like they, they just don't they're not there enough to actually get things done most of the time. So it ends up piling up in December like this. And I mean, Republicans aren't even negotiating. T you tell me if this makes sense. They're not even willing to really negotiate on what the top line numbers will be for for keeping the government open for the bills funding the government until after herschel walker's runoff next week which is like the two have nothing really to do with each other they just don't want to anger their base well that is going to be a problem and it's always interesting to see how the public who the public blames for these last minute negotiations and more importantly, now what is uh, becoming more common government shutdowns. Shout out to my friend Ty, regular listener of the show and any other government worker who, when the rest of us are talking about it, they are suffering from it because they're put out of work. I mean, it's a, it's, it's really a big, bad thing and it's completely political. And as you said, it's pretty new. It's only recently yeah. in, in the past. If the government shut down, politicians would be, would be very it'd be a real gamble because they'd be concerned about who's going to get the blame because it was generally seen as a not a good thing but obviously in this new world we live in government is a bad thing it's a it's a demon it's a groomer and and yeah. killing it is a good thing so if you shut down the government that sounds great on your radio show but it does not play out well in your community for reasons that we could talk about for hours it's just off right just, just wait until somebody needs a passport or needs to do something yeah. that involves government and then they find out they can't get it because the government's closed the other thing that we that's should when they mention, find out what the um, only good thing about government shutdowns is when uh, ignorant people unengaged people uneducated people find out what the government does that it's actually a thing doing stuff lots of stuff every day that makes your lives better more efficient safer etc yeah and i mean the other thing we should talk about here is there is a chance that democrats try to do another reconciliation bill mm. just to raise the debt limit and the reason for that is that if they go into next year without raising the debt limit again and again we, we should be clear so that everyone understands the Republicans love to make a big deal about this debt limit and oh how you know it's they're all bullshit vote for all this it's more all bullshit. Stuff. It's all bullshit. The fact of the matter is this is just paying your bill. You've already spent the money. You've already gone in and now the credit card company sends you the bill and says, pay this. And if you don't raise the debt limit, you're essentially saying, No, um, I will not pay this. And it yeah. could crash the entire economy. That's a but realistic concern. Have, Unlike debt and deficit, which I no longer want to discuss, even with other economists, I have been covering it long enough to know that it doesn't matter. It is a fucking red herring. And I am contractually obligated to my friend and listener, Sandman, to tell everybody to look up 
Stephanie Keltine in Modern Monetary Theory. I ran it by a few people. It's an interesting thing about, you know, countries with fiat currencies that issue their own money don't really have to worry that much about debt and deficit, certainly not if they have the resources that we do, the U.S., and it's just used to scare people because anybody can understand that. Debt and deficit, I can't, my household can't, states can't. But yeah, actually, the United States government can run debts and budget deficits and massive trillion-dollar debts for as long as we want because we can. And there's enough proof in our lives to see it's not actually doing anything to damage uh, our lives, our livelihoods, yeah. or our country's reputation. And I'll almost finish my rant because the thing that you said will if we don't pay our bills, that will actually affect our lives and communities. Yeah. I mean, I look, I am someone who thinks that there, there are reasons to want to try to get closer to a balanced budget. However, as you said, that is far less important than the debt limit. Happy to have um, a great the conversation limit, about the budget and where we should spend money and cut it. Let's do it. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. We, we can have that conversation. But if you don't raise the debt limit and you default, that's going to do really, really, really terrible things to the economy. And Republicans have already signaled that if we go into next year, they are going to try to extort all sorts of things out of Democrats uh, just for doing this. Sure. And Democrats have this mechanism, reconciliation, where they can raise the debt limit themselves right now. No Republican votes. The catch is it's very time consuming in the Senate. And Chuck Schumer doesn't seem to want to do this. OK, I, my attitude is if I was the Democratic leader. What I would do is I would like start this process, say, six days before Christmas and then dare Republicans to stall and delay and drag the whole process out, um, because my gamble would be that the Republicans would bet rather be at Christmas dinner than fighting on the floor of the Senate over this stuff. But that is something that Democrats should probably do in terms of good governance and could create a massive mess if they don't do it. But. I don't know that it's going to happen because it is a very time consuming process. I know Nancy Pelosi wants to do it. The election. I like your analysis there. I want to ask you about the Georgia runoff election and what does it matter? Why does it matter if Warnock wins, if Democrats already have control of the Senate? It matters for two very important reasons. A 51 49 Senate gives Democrats majorities on committees. That means they can issue subpoenas by themselves. That means they can get things out of committee onto the floor, like nominations, without relying on Republican help. And, you know, they have mechanisms for doing it now, but again, it's time consuming and it's problematic. So it would let them actually have a majority on these committees. Secondly, it gives you a uh, cushion um, for, for two things. First is in a 50 50 Senate, if anything happens to one member of the Senate. In one of those states where the governor's from the other party, it could flip control of the Senate. You don't want to keep you know playing with that fire. But more importantly, I think the Senate map is pretty bleak for Democrats in 24. I haven't actually put pen to paper on this yet. I want to write about how it's not quite as bad as people think, but it's not good. OK, and if you get one more seat, you're raising the chances of holding the Senate after that. There are three Democratic senators up in 2024 in states Donald Trump won twice. Um, John Tester in Montana, yep. Joe Manchin in West Virginia, and Sherrod Brown in Ohio. Right now, if, if you're at 50-50, all three of them have to win um, to hold the Senate because there are, there are almost no pickup opportunities for Democrats. You know, The two most vulnerable Republicans are probably Ted Cruz in Texas and Rick Scott in Florida. Not exactly good states for Democrats. The one thing they're right. going for them is both of those men seem to be incredibly unlikable people, um, which should open up some opportunity. But they don't have a lot of pickup opportunities. So right now you need to hold all three of those seats. It's hold the set. If yeah. Warnock wins, it, it drops to two. I mean, I think Democrats may rue the fact that they nominated the wrong guy to take on Ron Johnson in Wisconsin in a very winnable Senate race. Because if you had won that race, then you'd only need to hold one of those three. Oh, seats, I didn't, I didn't pay that practical. close attention to that Democratic primary. You're talking about uh, uh, Man Mandela Barnes, is that his name? Yeah, who, yeah, who's yeah, the, yeah. The really, he's a great candidate for a lot of reasons. I'm not sure what, what the, I didn't pay attention so, to the primaries. But, but, but hold on, <clears throat> before we uh, do the analysis on that one, which we probably shouldn't because that's over, it's, it's uh, mind-numbing and who knows what would have changed. But hold on. But. I want to ask you just about the, you know, you're making the points about what the, the, the all great points about Warnock 
if he wins, if Dems get two, why that matters, including that one about the map. I never thought about that in 2024, the Senate map, it gives him that much more of a cushion. But it also just one other thing that I read about it and I wanted to get your take on was it, it would weaken the stranglehold that Manchin and Cinema have had on the Democrats in the Senate, except I'm not sure that that matters because they don't have the House, so they can't actually get anything out of the Senate, which brings me to the question back to it's too bad they didn't win the House and they should have won it. But you wrote about this at your new sub stack. But for gerrymandering, then we would have not had to worry about Manchin or Cinema, and we could have actually gotten some amazing things done in these last two years of the Biden presidency. What do you think of what I'm saying? Right. right. So. We came pretty close. I think Ron Johnson beat Barnes by like 25 or 26,000 votes Mm. in Wisconsin. And Tony Evers, the Democrat governor and the Democrat attorney general ran way ahead of Barnes. In Mm. fact, they ran. I I saw yesterday Evers ran ahead of Barnes in every single county in the state because Barnes is an inspirational candidate. He's a good speaker, but he sounds uh, he said some things and, and tweeted some things. Uh, a while back that allowed him to be painted as a crazy leftist. Oh, and, and I, didn't know I think the, the exit polling I saw like 49% of Wisconsinites thought that uh, Ron Johnson was too extreme, but 46% thought that um, Mandela Barnes was too extreme. And so they seem to have sided with the devil. They knew what? over the one that they did. Oh my know. God. I mean, what could, what do you, what do you know? Of Tommy, what, what did he, what did he say or previously think that they, they painted him as being so radical on? Some- it was anti-police stuff, kind of some anti-America stuff hmm. where Johnson flat out got up in a debate and was like, you know, you don't really love America and that kind of thing. So it, it, was, it was stuff that like most Democratic strategists were like, yeah, we knew about this. We had this opposition research. Um, and they, they also in that primary was the state treasurer um, who uh, I, I always thought going back to the primary as, as a woman was the right candidate to take on Johnson in an environment shaped by the Dobbs decision. But she didn't really get traction and neither mm. did the wealthy Milwaukee Bucks executive who ran as well. That's so sad. It's it's it, it's so sad because like those are judgment calls like Mandela Barnes, you know, talking about law enforcement or his view on however you want to paint his view on patriotism or something like that versus the Senate's leading conspiracy theorist, Ron Johnson, who believes just about anything he has told or heard on coast to coast AM. I mean, the guy, and he's it's such an unlikable jerk. And yet he wanted so infuriating seeing as that the Democrat won yep. at the governor's seat. Tom Evers kept that. Yeah. So, but, yeah. but uh, what was yeah. my question? I mean, Back to gerrymandering, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take you to the house. The reason I bring that up is, that that would have been the 52nd seat to get rid of the filibuster yeah, and to really render mansion and cinema um, meaningless. And so that, that mattered for that thing in the house. Look, there are a million reasons why they lost the house because I don't think people understand how close this was. It looks like they're going to lose the house by five seats. The five closest seats won by Republicans in the house were decided by two of them by less than 600 votes, two of the, more by 1600 votes. And a fifth by like 2,500 votes. Wow. So you're talking about like less than 7,000 votes nationally out of like 103 or 107 million, something it like that. It doesn't get much passed. closer than that with yeah, no. five so seats. So you can point to a lot of reasons. But, you know, my, my analysis of gerrymandering goes against what a lot of people have said because they keep looking at this national picture, right? They keep saying, you know, Republicans won the national house vote by like two or three percent. Not a huge amount, but they did win. And the outcome in terms of percentage of seats versus percentage of the vote is going to be pretty close. What I say is, whoa, 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 that's a problem. You know, you guys are always talking about how when it comes to the presidency and the Electoral College, you know, we don't do things nationally like that. We do things state by state. Well, if you look at some of these states, both parties gerrymandered wherever they could. Right. But Democrats in New York, liberal judges threw the gerrymander out, say violates the state constitution you can't do this. So Democrats only really gerrymandered one big state in Illinois. Republicans gerrymandered Texas and almost gerrymandered Democrats out of existence in Florida. And then, you know, but then there's all these other smaller states. People keep pointing to that picture of like, well, Democrats did it in Illinois. Yeah. They did it in Nevada. They did it in New Mexico. OK, that's true. But they, what they don't see is I, I went through in the Substack post four or five states and there are like 10 or 12 of them. Where if you look at where how Democrats did in statewide races, 
they got, you know, a third of the vote. They got 40% of the vote, 45% of the vote. And like in some of these states, they got like no House members. I think in Tennessee, they're down to like one congressman out of 10 or something like that, or nine. Um, you know, in, in Oklahoma, they have zero. Like there, there, there were two Senate races and a governor's race there. And the Democratic candidate got, you know, somewhere in the 30s to low 40s in all three of those races. And they have zero members of the House. And you can go on and on. Utah is like this. You can go South Carolina. You go state by state. In every one of these states, Republicans drew a map that systematically underrepresents Democrats. And I'm not saying that Democrats wouldn't do the same thing. They just didn't have control of enough places to do this. Well, you start adding two or three seats in every state. The House margin is really small. And so gerrymandering did matter. It did play a role. Now, look, there there are other factors that, that played a role, like face planting in your state of New York. Yeah. And California certainly mattered. And they made some tactical blunders. One of those races that was decided by 1600 votes, literally Democrats spent like no money in that seat. They yeah. Didn't yeah. Billy, don't, don't get me started. Don't get me started. It's my district. And, you know, don't get me started on the, the campaign that they ran, which obviously all the misogyny against uh, Kathy Hochul. But more importantly, and in, in more insidious was the talk about crime. And there is no crime. Actually, it's fucking safe as hell. And they just said it over and over and it made people believe that. And it's just so it's such a terrible, terrible thing to do to use for so many reasons, especially because when we want to talk about policy and talk about bail reform and how much money it's saved and how amazing it's been for people's actual lives. And they just demonize it. And it worked. It really worked. And it scared the hell out of people that live in very, very safe places, making them think that crime was was everywhere. And it's uh, it's sadistic and it worked. I mean, uh, and they've been doing this for 50 years. Yeah, they Uh, have. uh, This is the Willie Horton ad reincarnate. This this is basically saying to suburbanites, many of whom, because the pandemic had not spent much time in cities. Oh my God! Like one guy got you know shot in the subway or something like this, or oh, one no. guy. And everybody thinks that if you let your kid, Brian, if you let your kid go into New York City, they will get pushed on the subway. And I always say to them, I know you've heard that it has happened like once or twice, but ha- do you do you know that there are kids that live in New York and ride the subway all day every day, millions of them safely? Come on, it's just it's crazy talk. And it's very effective, crazy talk. And of course, local news covers it. But yeah, it was effective. And And it's hard to combat. It is very hard for us to message against because I'm very involved in it here. Local Democratic Party politics. And it's, you know, it's really hard to message against that stuff and try to have a nuanced conversation with people about crime and bail reform and taxpayer money and and all of it. Police. I mean, and the local news is a huge part of the problem. And they have been for decades because the, the old adage is if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. Crime stuff is always, you know, you, you turn on the TV, you hear in Philadelphia, you turn on the TV, um, you, you get the news People on the love it. It's the most popular something. podcasts in the world of the crime stuff. You know, I mean, it's it's certainly, yep. yeah. yeah. The, the first three stories every night is this shooting, that shooting, yep. this murder. What they don't actually tell you is, here's the bottom line. It is incredibly unsafe in very small pockets of predominantly African-American poor neighborhoods where you have young black men shooting young black men. And, and that is the unfortunate reality. And we should do something about it. But all these suburbanites who are like, oh, we need tough on crime policies. That has absolutely no impact on their lives at all. Yeah. They and are let's not just less say, safe. And, and because you use that as an example, and I know you know this probably better than I do, there is a lot being done about that type of crime in those communities. They need help. What they need is resources and good schools and boys and girls clubs and places for kids to go. I'm glad I had places to go when I was growing up, but I'll tell you what, I always like to use this as an example. And the hour we had to kill before lacrosse practice started is when we got arrested, Brian, for mailbox baseball. So it's a matter of like kids having place safe places to be and and resources and money. And so when you say we have to do something about that, we need to make sure they have all the resources and aren't marginalized, obviously. But we need to do some about guns. There's so many things we can do, but also there's so many things that they are doing. And I just didn't want that to get lost because I talked to those activists right. and community leaders a lot. So but it works. It's effective messaging. And you're you're right to make that point. Yeah. And I mean, look, the, the even down to we need to that there was a program here in Philadelphia a while ago that funneled resources that had parole officers working 4 p.m. to midnight, had more cops walking a beat where they knew the teens in the neighborhood and they could say, what are you, what are you doing over there? You know, like 
Are you going to get yourself in trouble here? Just little things like that that have a proven impact on reducing these. Well, things. Nobody wants to spend sure money were, on that. Nobody wants to spend no, any money on that. No. Yeah. And, and sure, there were some prosecutors in some cities, some DAs who have overcorrected. But the fix there is very narrow. The fix is like, hey, if this guy's got a rap sheet as long as your arm and there's a lot of crimes of violence, then, yes, you charge him, you know, you, you, you sentence him more seriously, things like that. Yep. But that's a very small fix. Yep. And all these other things that you're talking about are much better fixes. It just doesn't make for good politics. It's easy to scare people. And there's all kinds of cognitive research that when you scare them and they're emotionally worked up, that they're not, you know, analyzing things at the same. Right. No, yeah, level. it's very tribal. Yeah, yeah. You can tell us all about that. Yeah. Yeah. Really. I mean, it, it's so it, it's a very effective thing. And Democrats didn't really know how to counter message it. And look, I, I think the left in national politics didn't help things. You know, the, the moderates in the House Democrat caucus were pleading for more funding for police. And and Pete, whatever you think about the policy, this was like a messaging vote. Well, yeah, this but was they, not gave, something- they gave so. But but let's be clear. Democrats gave more funding to police, much to the chagrin right. of many of us on the left that think that money should be would be better resource in in other ways. And obviously that's a uh, right, right. but but and, th- and I'm not even talking about the policy. I'm talking about the fact that moderate members of the House Democrat caucus were begging, give us a vote on this so we can vote for this because this will help us right. in the election. Right. And, you know, the, the AOC wing of the party wouldn't give them that, even though the Senate, it wasn't going anywhere in the Senate. Like it was something where it wasn't going to affect policy. Yeah. But again, they are distorting this. They are weaponizing this. It's really bad. Um, and it's suddenly Democrats have got to get better at messaging on. Yeah. Democrats, well, that's... I mean, legitimately, Democrats are poor at messaging in Very general. Hard. They go ahead. They're dem- poor at messaging. What? They're, they're poor at messaging in general. To, you know, we, to, to bring back to the, the issue I talked about, like, it should be a no-brainer that you put some sort of paid sick leave bill on the floor now yeah. and make Republicans vote on it again. Um, you know, the, some that, of the, the I, will, I will were, say I will only say this. I completely agree with that. We can both think of many examples where there's some bad messaging or the, it, it was not done well or people didn't even know that this candidate existed or that this election was happening. I do just always love to push back on the idea, though, which is. Man, being inside campaigns, Brian, Democratic campaigns or campaigns for what I would what they call normies or people living on Earth One. We're trying to do our campaign and we're forced to have to react to a thing that didn't happen. And it's very hard to react to a thing that didn't happen that people just posted on Facebook that the principal of our high school was doing a thing that they weren't doing. But it doesn't matter what the truth is. And so when we counter message, you can't get ahead of their controversy du jour you can't get ahead of sharia law is going to be brought into your community or crt you can't get ahead of those things because you don't anticipate them but as soon as they put them out there it's over and how do we confront and combat that is a real struggle for those of us that are working inside progressive activism well first of all peter you tell me your high school was one of the ones where they're putting litter boxes in the classroom for, for all those kids. I, who, well, I, they, it's I, a grain I, of truth. I put one litter box in my daughter's <laughs> classroom because I was helping her with a bit is all. We were doing this bit. It got carried away, Brian. Next thing you know, kids are asked if they identify as cats or dogs. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, I, I agree with you about I, I don't think counter messaging is the, the way to do this. What I think Democrats need to do is highlight more issues where they can win the framing war, where they can win the messaging war. Stuff like paid sick leave. Make Republicans vote on it over and over yeah. and over again, yeah. because at least in the abstract, it's very popular. Um, you know, put them back on their heels, make them vote on things that ma- that split their coalition that are uncomfortable for them. And try to dominate what issues we talk about in elections and what issues are kind of the major ones. And, and like, you know, for example, I know climate is an important issue, but Democrats haven't hit on a good message on it. So don't keep emphasizing it over and over again. Don't, you know, uh, I'll give you another example. The number of Democratic politicians who keep saying, like, we want to put coal out of business or something like that. I agree with their policy goal. But you know what you don't say? You don't ever talk about putting any business out of business. No, you say we want to we want to have coal jobs. miners. We want to have coal miners working on solar panels, breathing clean air, making better money and having better benefits. You know, yeah, I, I, I hear you. But right. again, I would I get I'm not pushing back. I, I mean, I agree. I would only just add to it's hard for us to get if whatever message that you hypothetically that we you and I hypothetically created that would be effective if we came up with that, it was the perfect message. It's hard because we live 
and you could talk about this. You're the expert in a media atmosphere that has vacuum cleaners all over the place that suck up so much. And on a day when Kanye is getting pushback by Alex Jones, it's so hard for us to get our message out because the news dominates as they wanted to. It's the it's the strategy by Bannon and Trump and and et al., which is flood the zone with shit so that we can't get our messages that you and I agree would be effective if anybody would hear them over the sound of swastikas on twi- landing on Twitter with Elon Go- uh, Musk and so on. Yeah, I mean, look, the, some there were the analyses during the campaign of like the number of minutes Fox was devoting to crime and how it like plummeted as soon as the campaign was over. You know, w- once they had successfully scaremongered enough to to get what they wanted. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. Do I think National Democrats need to be more savvy and strategic in what they're doing? Yes, but the media machine makes this hard, and I think the mainstream media plays into this too, Pete. Because the mainstream media loves conflict. They love, you know, addressing things that they, 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 they tend to address everything in hyperbolic terms. You know, people that they flogged inflation relentlessly. They could have talked about low unemployment, yeah. growth in the economy. There were lots of other things, frames they could have adopted. They focused on inflation. They talked about crime um, and, and, you know, they, they brought into this border crisis thing. Um, and some of that. So, so I think that, that the media is a big problem in this. But Democrats, even if you go back to the, the 70s, really, have not done a good job of coming yep. up with a positive message that I resonates with people and, and not sounding extreme. You know, Hold on a second. I'm got a, I've got an emergency, which means I have to wrap this up. And the emergency is my daughter's late for work and I didn't realize I had to take her. Oh. So let me just uh, wrap it up here. But Brian, thank you so much for joining me. So great, as always. My pleasure, Pete. All right, there he goes, Dr. Brian Rosenwald. And check out his new Substack, brianrosenwald.substack.com. Let him know that you heard him here on the show by looking him up on Twitter at brianros1. Brian Ross1, I guess I could say, or a Brian Ros one That's all I've got for you on today's show. Thank you, Jared Yates Sexton. Thank you, Brian Rosenwald, and thank you for listening and especially for subscribing. On Monday, I'll have a very special conversation with authors, co-authors of the book, In a Different Key, which is the story of autism. Karen Zucker and the great John Donvan, my friend John Donvan, join me to talk about their new documentary that partners with their book. It's going to air on PBS, so I'm starting to promote that now. Also, Mara Quint will join me tomorrow night at the Hangout. She's going to stop by. I hope to see you there. Sign up now. Stand up. Pete.com. That's it. That's all I am signing off for today. Be the change you want to see in the world. Meditate a little, write a little, and read a little every day. That's my new routine, my advice for you that so many have given to me. I'm paying it forward. I love you guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow. John Carroll, take us out today. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, but they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the would begin, they had to stand up, all right, they had to stand up, we got to stand up, we got to look the devil square in the eye, we got to let him know, it's his time to go, to make it clear when all we hear is